So I wanted to do two things. I wanted to talk about my work um, as a student, because I think that's something that's extremely helpful to people as they're going through a BFA program. So I wanted to talk about my progression as an artist and then kind of land on this recent body of work, which you, you, you'll get a chance to see at the Art Lab. Um, so in my undergraduate uh, studies, I kind of, in my third and fourth year, I really, I was enamored by Susan Sontag. Does anyone know who Susan Sontag is? She's a really, really popular uh, theorist on photography, has written a lot about photography, amongst other things, but when I was introduced to her, she talked about photography, and one of the things that really grasped me was when she said, so successful has been the camera's role in beautifying the world that photographs, rather than the world, have become the standard of the beautiful. And I think that's more true as time goes by. And I think that's something we can all relate to as photography continues to represent our world and saturate our world with images that, in a way, uh, start to become a little bit unrealistic and our expectations get raised to this level where you know we expect the world to be beautiful all the time. And I think that's tragic because we kind of lose the sense of what is actually beautiful. We can't actually see it when we see it. We think of photographs when we think of a beautiful landscape. We think of photographs when we think of a beautiful portrait or loved ones. We kind of lose our memory. But myself, I was very interested in landscapes at the time. Um, and like many early and young photographers, uh, it was just a fun way to to explore the world around me. So I started taking these beautiful photographs of landscapes. And I soon realized that it actually, it became very boring <laughs> to kind of keep taking these photographs of, you know, like the Windows screensaver photographs and the, the Macintosh screensaver photograph. When you, they, they're really eye candy and you, you kind of, you lose a, you, you, you almost start forgetting what the real, the beauty of the real world because you, you, you think of, you know, these landscape photographs as being perfect, when the world isn't perfect. So in a way, I, I, I tried to think of a strategy that can kind of exploit this, and, and one way I did it was, I thought maybe if I, kind of lit the real world like a stage, I can kind of make a farce out of these landscape photographs. And it can start playing with that, I, that notion of uh, photography and beauty in photography, landscape. Um, and so the result was this kind of funny, uh, aesthetically pleasing still. Let me just see, let's put it on automatic. Um, <laughs> And to me, it was really a critique of the landscape photograph while retaining a lot of its traditional element. Um, and just looking at them today, I mean, I, I still find a lot of value in this, in this body of work. It's something I want to return to eventually, uh, and we'll see what happens, because I think uh, they're captivating, there's something interesting happening in them that I still haven't fully resolved. But yes, I mean, uh, it was just a, a way of breaking out of what is the normal landscape photograph. I don't know if any of you heard of Lan uh, Ansel Adams, for example. He's probably one of the most famous landscape photographers uh, and he photographed Yosemite in California. And, you know, his photographs are stunning, and if you see them in a gallery, they're really, really beautiful. And his whole body of work uh, was tied into a kind of conservation effort. So his, his way of, of spreading the beauty of the landscape <coughs> through photography was a way of making people understand that it is a thing, it's beautiful, and we should save it. But in a way, I think, what he did and what he kind of created was this cult of 
images of, of nature that really, you know, uh, may have actually taken away from our appreciation of nature because we really do imagine these photographs rather than the landscape. So this was my third year of undergrad, and then in my fourth year of undergrad, um, well, between my third and fourth year of undergrad, I really had this idea that I wanted to make something uh, bigger, something grounded in the real world. And I was really uh, enamored at the time by these books by, I guess you could say philosophers, uh, theorists, um, that were talking about religion. They were talking about uh, religion taking over culture, especially in America. Uh, and growing up in a mildly religious household, my, my mother was quite religious at the time. My father, on the other hand, didn't care at all, and my brother was a scientist. So in our house together, we had, and then I was somewhere in between, I had no idea what was going on. Um, I just became curious about you know, what, what, what it really was. And the more I read about it, the more I, 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 I looked at images online, I discovered this really weird movement in the States. Uh, that consisted of mega churches. Have people heard of mega churches? Some people. I mean, they're these kind of bizarre entities, and they're they're usually in America, and they're starting to pop up in Asian countries as well. But they're churches that can typically s seat over five thousand people, um, and often even more than that. So, in in America, for example, there are churches that can fit um, over 30,000 people, which if you think about that, is pretty weird. It's, churches are supposed to be community-based, <laughs> and they're not supposed to be um, these cultish concert size uh, uh, performances. But that's what it kind of, that was the explosion happening uh, at the time, and here's one that's very particularly speaking of this. So this is a, a oops, a baseball, uh, sorry, a basketball court that was converted into a church. And it has five services a week and it fills the rafters and there's, I guess that would make it about 150,000 people attend a week. And I thought that was the most bizarre thing in the world. And I still do, I think it's a strange thing. Um, so I started touring the landscape and photographing what I thought was bizarre and the things that I thought were strange. And I thought, well, if I put them all together, um, maybe it would make for an interesting project. So I called it Searching for Jesus, because that's kind of what I was doing in a way. I was searching for signs of Christianity in the landscape um, and symbols of Christianity and how these symbols can, through photography, maybe say something greater than um, a single image could. Because at the time, I mean, when you try to think of artistic bodies of work that deal with religion, we're kind of trapped in this world of, you know, the, you know, maybe painting in the 1500s. Uh, not a lot of people try to touch religion in an artistic context, but I think it's such a large social part of our lives that I think examining it from an outside perspective and from an artistic perspective, uh, I was thinking could lend some value to people's understanding of it. And, and, and it wasn't something that was judgmental on my part. I wasn't for or against religion, I was just trying to see what, what kind of symbols I could mash up and what kind of um, feelings I could evoke via images of the religious landscape. And this is the first time I actually really learned the value of sequencing in photography, of putting images before and after each other, um, how images can act as a group and have a different meaning than single images. I think this is valuable for all artistic practices, not just photography, but 
um, sequencing your work and, and thinking about symbols and groups of images and how they can say something quite a bit greater than, than one thing ever could. But in photography, of course, there's a rich tradition of photo books that has been kind of progressing along. And sequencing has become something that's incredibly important within photography, especially within documentary photography. Um, almost since the beginning of photography, really, we've realized that grouping images together can, can have a really strong impact. And just something about process, I mean, in terms of photography in a project like this, I think one of the most valuable things you learn is what to include and what to throw away in terms of photographing. And because photography is so disposable and you can take so many images today, you really, it takes a kind of strict understanding of of the, the vocabulary of images to, to say, you know, like I can throw this one away, even though aesthetically it might be my best photograph. It really doesn't say anything new. Um, so paring down a large body of work, I, and I don't know how many of you are interested in photography particularly, but uh, doing something like this allows you to take a ton of photographs, but then you have to really uh, concentrate on what, what's important and, and what you're trying to say. So after that, maybe you'll see a theme developing. Um, I became interested in the landscape again, but it, uh, but not in in a beautiful kind of way. So I I tried to think of how can I represent a landscape in new ways. Um, not the traditional beautiful scenes and the, just the hunt for aesthetic uh, composition. But how can I talk about the landscape and a modern and contemporary landscape? So I, it would, and this was all photographed over one summer, but I would spend every single day after work from about 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. So they all share this similar aesthetic sunset kind of look because it's just, the time of day was when I could shoot them. Um, but I began to just travel around my city and neighboring cities, and I really became curious about how power flows through our city. Um, and that may seem very boring at first, but it was really surprising the strange kind of scenes you come across when you follow them long enough. And the ones that ended up surprising me are the ones that I kept and the ones that you kind of see here. There's a lot of, you can imagine, there's a lot of boring photographs in this project and a lot of wasted time walking along boring paths. But every once in a while, like this for example, you'd come, or this, I mean, you'd come across these really wonderful moments when the landscape seemed to meld with these uh, power lines and they began to kind of speak about how important and iconic and how reliant we are on them. Um, because I really started to see them as the thing that keeps society going. I mean, if we didn't have these power lines, we'd have literally none of the comforts we enjoy. So even though these things are incredibly banal, incredibly boring, objects in the landscape that have become so repetitive and we ignore them completely, uh, I kind of wanted to lend some kind of importance to them uh, by photographing them and bringing them back into the forefront of what, what our landscape actually contains and what the importance of these very bizarre, unphotogenic objects. <laughs> So moving on, so landscape is something that I've focused on a lot. I've noticed, and I notice now that I'm talking about it. Uh, 
but when I moved to Halifax to do an MFA, uh, I kind of got, became enamored by Piggy's Cove. And for those of you who know Piggy's Cove, it's the place you must go, apparently, if you go to Halifax. Um, and Piggy's Cove is absolutely beautiful, but you know, it's not the only thing to see in Halifax, but everybody, and it's very similar to a lot of other places in Halifax. But if you go there, everyone's gonna, everyone's gonna say, did you go to Peggy's Cove? Have you seen Peggy's Cove? And undoubtedly, you can tell it's, it's kind of amazing. And it's set atop a, this rocky bluff and there's a lighthouse. There's the tour shops and there's everything you'd expect from a tourist stop. But there's this weird combination of the sublime and the photogenic. And this is maybe the first time I really started to meditate on photography and how much we're really, really taking too many pictures and not appreciating the landscape. So maybe just so I can stop talking for a second, I will play a short clip from a video I'll talk about these in a second. But this is a video I made, um, and I'll talk about it after a minute. in the background, but has, does, do people notice anything strange happening here? Anybody? Incredibly unparticipatory process. Yes. Um, like the clouds are moving super fast. Like, I don't know huh? if that's what that is, but. <laughs> yeah, that's something. Uh, so that's, yeah, I mean, any, yeah. Yeah, so, and that woman just crawled out from under a rock. <laughs> so, uh, the whole point of this video was for you to, to, to think that it was very normal, but then maybe you, to, to think suddenly that you were seeing uh, something kind of unreal. And the process of making this video was extremely long, because each one of these people are rotoscoped out of the video, so they're, they become characters that I can fully control. Um, so I can tell them when to come in and when to leave. 
I can have them loop, I can have them disappear. Um, so it becomes this really weird video that at first seems incredibly natural and then seems anything but so. So the first half of the video, the clouds roll in and then time stops and then the second half of the video, the clouds roll back in and, and the tourist place kind of resets and there's nobody there and suddenly it all happens over again. And then I can kind of create new variants of this, of this cast of characters. But when I, the reason I made this was because when I visited Peggy's Cove, and when you ever go to a tourist place again, I encourage you to spend you know, your time enjoying the place, but then go back and just watch people. <laughs> because it becomes funny, because it feels like tourist places are in this infinite loop of the same thing happening over and over again. People look at the same thing, they take the same pictures, you know, like that woman, she just takes the same picture every 10 minutes <laughs> and she's trapped in this kind of virtual world. And I really began, began, began seeing these places as virtual worlds, these tourist spaces as these virtual worlds where nothing real ever happens. <laughs> yeah. I'll stop it there. If you're interested, you can always see it. It's only 10 minutes. But yeah, I spent, so for my MFA, I, I spent 90% of it thinking about what I wanted to do, and then spent two months in the world's most photographed places. And this was actually quantified by a, a team at MIT, and they, they read the tags of all the Flickr photographs in the world, and they kind of quantified um, the World, the world's most photographed places, first of all, and just how many photographs are taken in places like this. And you can imagine how bizarre it is that we're all taking the exact same pictures. Uh, so instead of the places, I really became interested in photographing the people. Uh, and I kind of fell in love with this pose and this gesture of looking at a screen, because it really seemed like more people were looking at their cameras than looking at the places around them. So I called them camera portraits. And I used a flash, so they're kind of lit in this beautiful way. But uh, it became about the act of the photograph. And the act of people looking was no longer looking. It was more of trying to capture something. And this, maybe I'll stop. Oh, let me just go back. This one, for, this one, for me, it says it all. She's in like love over here, <laughs> and this other guy is like, uh, he's taking another picture. But there, I don't know. She's doing something. I think she's putting her thumb on the Eiffel Tower or something. It's just something we all do. We love taking pictures. So now, uh, seeing them on the screen is one thing, but seeing a gallery full of really quite large prints of people taking pictures of, is a pretty bizarre thing. This is another one of my favorites, because the one time that someone really wasn't looking, and she did that without knowing I was there, but she had covered her eyes, uh, and I don't know, just to maybe hear the place or just not look for a second. But yeah, I mean, if you've ever been in a tourist place, if you've ever been to Rome, if you've ever been to London, if you've ever been almost anywhere in Italy or, or France, you'll be kind of swarmed by these mobs of people. And again, I took so many pictures, like too many pictures of people taking pictures, but in the end, there was only about 11 of them that for me are really, really interesting and beautiful and start talking about like this gesture and the connection we have with our screen. So going back to Peggy's Cove, um, apart from the video, I also kind of started to, again, play with that notion of the ideal landscape. 
Um, I call this Peggy's Cove an ideal composition because again, it's taken from, uh, I think about, I can't remember now, but about nine or 10 photographs. And you know, if you keep your camera on the, at the same spot uh, and just keep taking pictures, uh, you can you can manipulate that picture again and you can start creating new photographs and new scenes and new arrangements of people. So I wanted, I was really playing with the idea of what is an ideal photograph of Peggy's Cove? Like if you wanted to have the perfect picture of Peggy's Cove, without the lighthouse at least, you know, this might be one of them, but it's completely fake. So I just thought that was really funny. And uh, in this photograph, I know it's a little small, but this photograph, instead of me constructing now, is a photograph that was created from over 30 of, uh, sorry, over 50 of other people's photographs of Peggy's Cove. So I started downloading images from Flickr and tried to, and it was like a big jigsaw puzzle. I started to put together um, people's memories and people's photographs and people's uh, account of Peggy's Cove, and I kind of recreated it into this surreal, I mean it doesn't look like this if you've been there, it's not a big mound of rocks like this, but still these are all of Peggy's Cove, so together they create this kind of weird mishmash of memory and time and, and place, and here are just some details, so these are all different people from different photographs from different times, all at Peggy's Cove, but not together. And what that allowed me to do was actually make a really big photograph. It was kind of a cool thing to see very large, this kind of absolutely fake landscape. Alright. So that leads me to uh, the new body of work. There's one moment here. I wanted, I wanted to play one really quick moment from John Oliver. Does anyone here like John Oliver? so much. We only allow scientists to be portrayed by the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger, <coughs> Nicolas Cage, and Al Pacino. That is how much we respect them and the complexity of the work they do. Science is constantly producing new studies, as you would know if you ever watched TV. A new study shows how sugar might fuel the growth of cancer. A new study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. A new study shows that drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. What? your sassy aunt would wear on a t-shirt. <laughs> and when studies aren't blanketing TV, they're all over your Facebook feed with alerts like study finds liberals are better than conservatives at smizing, your cat might be thinking about killing you, and scientific study shows that bears engage in fellatio. And by the way, I'm not interested. Let me know when bears start engaging in some mutually pleasurable 69ing. Hashtag bear pleasure, hashtag feminism. <laughs> not everybody, but I think something that's pretty common is we think of science as another thing. Um, we think of it um, as authoritative, yes, uh, but some, somehow we don't really have a lot of lines of communication between um, 
scientists and the rest of us. So we rely on the media. And you can see what kind of starts happening when we rely on the media to sensationalize uh, science. And even when it's not like silly, ridiculous stuff like, like that, I think uh, even then we, we really get wrapped up in how science is represented more than what like, trying to understand what's actually happening. Uh, so one of the roots of this project is my interest in, in kind of these hidden places, these places that we don't really get a chance to see very often, we hear about. Um, and a few of them do get out in the media and we do have an understanding of them. Places like CERN, I'm sure a whole a bunch of you have at least heard of CERN and perhaps some idea of what it is or what it does. But generally speaking, a lot of what happens in the scientific community and in the world of science is really lost on us. And I thought as a, as a photographer, and as an artist, I could kind of maybe lend some kind of new understanding in these spaces and kind of see what an artistic viewpoint can bring uh, in a dialogue with the science and in a dialogue with these spaces that are actually quite bizarre and uh, maybe overrepresented in the wrong kinds of media. So I usually, and having this show at the Art Lab was a really good first uh, exhibit because it was the first time I could actually spread out some work and see it in a large space. And one thing I really appreciated about that opportunity was to see what, what kind of impression are, are the photographs I'm taking leaving on people. Because it's all been in my head until then. And I was happy to find that Generally speaking, they're not a simplistic, there wasn't a simplistic understanding. It didn't seem as though people were finding them as a typical representation of what they understand science is. And my whole goal uh, in, in photographing places like this is when I go there, I really, I'm not interested in just making beautiful pictures or just showing off technology, or just uh, trying to make aesthetically pleasing images alone. But I wanted to make um, kind of very mysterious uh, images that would actually make you more curious about what you were looking at, rather than try to lend some understanding uh, to you, or try to make you understand what's happening in these facilities. I, I'd rather you look at these pictures be intensely curious about what is happening in these spaces. Um, and maybe want to find out more, maybe not, but at least uh, start questioning what you know and what, what you think is happening in this world. Um, so I kind of purposefully don't, and I, I've been debating this, but I purposefully don't uh, tell people where they're taken unless they ask. Uh, and I prefer to leave most of the, the, the understanding of the image to the person who's viewing it. And of course, if you ask me where they're taken, I'll tell you. But I really, I really think the value of seeing the show without knowing right away uh, will make you really wonder what's, what's going on with the world around you. Uh, and be curious about these uh, kind of pursuits that human nature has kind of felt as though were necessary since the very beginning of uh, you know, the first technological discovery. And we can consider things like fire or the wheel as the roots of technology. And ever since then, we've kind of been nonstop barreling through and attempting to learn more, change our environment, our environment more, do more with it, shape it more. We need to know more. But we also, in my opinion, have to keep a dialogue open with you know, what's happening, what are the effects of these discoveries, and what is the root of this unquenchable kind of uh, 
mission that we always are interested in pursuing. So I ended up choosing just 10 photographs um, for the show, and obviously, when you limit yourself to just 10 photographs, uh, you have to kind of decide on what you're trying to express. And for me, it was really, I was really interested in showing these kind of vast, sometimes lonely, sometimes boring, um, interconnected areas. Um, the architectures of these spaces became and are still extremely interesting to me. Now this one's interesting. Maybe you can't see it on the screen, but there's a, a little person here uh, working away amongst this kind of pseudo-mobile uh, workstation. It's on wheels, but I don't think they'd ever move it. Uh, but yeah, it shows how augmented we've become and how helped we are by these discoveries that we made. In this case, it's kind of this massive electronic computer computation that allows us to do way more than we ever could have imagined uh, even a, even a dozen or so years ago. And then, you know, when you contrast something like that to something like this, which is a global seed storage facility, um, extremely low tech, but for me this was a really key image in the, in the exhibition because most of the other photographs are about these kinds of advances um, that we're consistently pursuing. But this one seems to be more about having a space to actually save something that we might lose through our, uh, our progression uh, by scientific means. And, and when I say that, I mean literally, this is, it's been called the doomsday uh, device. Uh, but it's just a hole in a mountain in the Arctic, and it's it's there, and this is vault number three, which is still empty. So it's there for the future. Okay, the vault number one is full, vault number two is getting full, but it's just all of the seeds that we have in our world that we don't want to lose. So if, if there is a natural disaster, you know, another nuclear meltdown, or um, if there's a great flood somewhere, and they lose you know, all the local crops. There's actually a real danger that we can never get that back. Um, and often, these disasters are, are really, they are man-made and they're, they can be avoidable. But through our pursuit of technology, we have to also uh, be aware of this kind of danger. So these vast spaces, for me, and I don't have a lot of people in my photographs, but every once in a while things kind of work out so well that um, I have to take a picture with a person. And I've started to take more, uh, but I found that I really didn't want them to be portraits about, about scientists working in the field, because we it becomes boring. Um, I'll leave that to... Science, you know, Scientific American magazine and stuff like that. But uh, in this particular photograph, and this is the the leader. I'm not sorry, leader is the wrong word, but the uh, I think director or the head of the entire CERN project, and he's been running it for about five years. So CERN is the lar one of the largest, if not the largest, scientific kind of uh, projects that humankind has historically embarked on. Um, it was partially successful, and now they've kind of doubled the power of this project, but essentially it's this hu um, huge uh, ring uh, under, oh geez, I forget. It's partially under France, Switzerland, and based in Geneva, but it actually crosses the border of three countries. 
And uh, actually, I'm going to backtrack a little because I confused the two very briefly. This photograph is actually at Alma, which is another uh, really, really large experiment. CERN being the first one. Alma is a huge radio telescope project uh, where over 50 satellites were constructed on the hilltops of Chile. So my mistake, I apologize for that. But yet another one of the one, another one of the largest kind of uh, projects that, that that we've pursued. And in the landscape, he just kind of sat there, and he was posing for other people, these foxes. But there's a really great moment when he didn't think anyone was taking a picture because I have I work with the view camera and I, it's very slow and it's very unimposing because people don't understand what's actually happening. So, and they don't know when you take a picture, which is great. So there was this moment of when he was just kind of, I, it, it really was a moment of contemplation, in my opinion. But it felt like a moment of loneliness, and almost like that fox just sitting there in that kind of strange landscape, him sitting there, and it's just the overall bizarreness of the dichotomy between the satellites and the desert and the sky and the quiet um, became this, and it, it, it became this really beautiful photograph that, to me, really spoke about um, the scientific adventure and how it's a lot more complex than we often give it credit. It's not. Well, maybe I'll ask just a quick question. How many of you uh, believe that technology will save us? You know, will will essentially lead to progress all the time? I'm curious because when I was young, and I'm talking quite young, uh, maybe eight, nine, ten, I had this kind of blanket feeling that the future was going to be absolutely amazing. And I wonder, today, do people have that feeling that everything is progressing and, and everything is getting better and a lot of our problems will be solved? I, uh, I can't remember when it started shifting for me. And it's not that I'm negative towards science or, or negative towards technology. And I, I obviously think that we're in control of our, you know, of our own destiny. Uh, I guess when, when I was younger, I really just had a high, like higher hopes that I look back now and I just think, oh, computers were amazing. We're going to be able to live in a virtual world and we can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. We're going to fix everything. But that really, uh, that's kind of a really naive and strange thing to believe. Because as I, as I got older, I really, I started to, and I think we're all seeing negative impacts from 
progress. So for me, that was really the root of a project like this, was uh, what is the notion of progress? And um, how can I photograph that? Um, and what are we losing? And what, you know, what are we gaining? So, you know, do, you, indirectly, there are really photographs about spaces and places and environments of uh, what I like to think of, like envir environments that are really shaping our future. Uh, I like to imagine that this body of work will eventually become uh, more about uh, a place for contemplation of you know, the give and take between one of our most prized kind of possessions, which is uh, technology and science, and because uh, we really do value that as a culture. I mean, we really have always valued this, this notion of progress, and tied to that is technology, and they're kind of inseparable. So really, when I photograph these things, I feel like I'm, I'm photographing uh, this kind of moral question, or at least I'm trying to. So I think uh, when, you, when you look at the, the 10 photographs together, you start getting um, well, when I look at them, I guess I, that's all I can really speak about. When I look at these 10 photographs together, I kind of, I see uh, a lonely kind of journey uh, that, that feels a little bit cold and endless um, and remote, but also beautiful, because it really is, it's an amazing accomplishment, but it's also riddled with other questions. So this, for me, is another kind of key photograph. I think I kind of found somebody who was investigating um, daguerreotypes. So they were using this uh, this beam line. So what a what a beam line really is is it's a big circle. So you put an object somewhere in this, like maybe five kilometer. Uh, tube that runs around the facility, and it, the beam is so strong it can, without damaging anything, it's shooting photons and light through an object, and it can map it out, and it can see through it. And it was really great that she was looking at images um, and a daguerreotype in a picture as it kind of decomposed over time, and they're trying to figure out what's like what is happening. <coughs> for this image to break down. Um, and for me, this is one of the first times that um, in math, uh, it was just one of the first times where it started to make sense to me uh, that there should be more relationship between art and science, and there should be more you know, give and take. And this was kind of a door me with someone who is also interested in art um, to kind of have a real interesting discussion about what they're doing, what I'm doing, and, and what we can do together. Um, but this image breaking down, this portrait breaking down, and this kind of scientific evaluation of an artistic object became really interesting to me. And I think it's full of nice metaphors, which I won't really say or unravel directly, but I think um, I think it's going to just become more interesting to me, uh, that image in particular, as I move on. And this is the final kind of picture, and it's, it's kind of one of my favorites, because it's just it's a workstation, and there's just a green button that says push to exit. You can't really read it. And there's a little dog cabin in the corner. And I kind of feel like this person 
Uh, well, it just works as a wonderful metaphor for like, I wish there was some time here with the green button so we could exit this bizarre world we live in. <laughs> but imagine being, I mean, this, like most of the facilities I photograph, like if you spent eight hours in these really loud, computerized, futuristic laboratory spaces, I think you could start pining for a simpler life. And I think maybe society might eventually get there, where we might start pining for a simpler existence. Uh, this is, well, you'll see the show, so I won't really talk about it too much, um, that piece. But the, this, these four panels are, are four, supers, four uh, racks from the server room at CERN. So that was the actual place um, that is probably, if not the largest, one of the largest uh, scientific projects that we've embarked on. So they're not just regular computers, they're actually computers that are meant to discover something new, which I thought is kind of cool. Um, because they, they were searching for something called the Higgs boson, which is supposed to be uh, this, this property in which most of the world is made up, but we can't see it or we can't find it, so it's invisible. And so there's these computers chugging along, waiting for this split second uh, moment where they can analyze this this very small amount of time to find out if they can actually locate this very elusive thing. Um, and you know, like 20 years ago, we couldn't have even fathomed finding this thing, but now we actually found it, so what are we going to do with it? So inside the, the outside wall of the gallery, there is these other images that are um, of objects of the past, um, but at the time, were you know cutting edge technology. Now this is kind of laughable in a way, but this is the first virtual reality kind of prototype, at least at the University of Toronto. There was probably a few others at the time, but um, along with teaching tools, this one in particular is funny to me because it's a broken nervous system. Uh, but things like light bulbs, manuals to redundant computers, um, wooden mazes, films about the ocean. it's better because you can kind of see it in the show now. But the final image is uh, it's a little card that um, psychologists used to give to patients to kind of uh, analyze. So they would ask probably, I'm imagining a patient to kind of tell them what they saw in the card. And that in that card is a particular motion that can be read as either threatening or relaxing or positive and is like either a choking motion or a massaging motion and you decide what what that card says and I really like that as a, the last thing you see in the exhibition because I want that kind of feeling of um, I really wanted to evoke a feeling of you know is this technology helping us or is it choking us, is it, uh, is it too much? And you know what, I'll leave it at that. It's eight o'clock on the dot, and I think if you haven't seen the show, well I think everyone should come, yeah, so everyone should come and see the show and then we can have a question and answer there. In the space, and just, I'm sure Susan will tell you, make sure you come back. <laughs>